Cool. Well, it's um, half past now. So uh, welcome and yeah, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you're based uh, in the world. And welcome to uh, this webinar that we're hosting today uh, together, um, hosted by EU TechBridge, uh, LCBA Canada and the Vancouver Economic Commission. And today we're joined with by the city of Vancouver and their neighborhood energy utility. Uh, who will be today presenting uh, their challenge or challenges uh, of which they're seeking innovative um, solutions. Uh, so we will go through uh, their challenge today and then how you guys can uh, engage in these challenges and how the partners you can see at the bottom here can help you engage in this. The agenda for today, as I said, we'll just have a quick introduction from myself uh, and then LCBA Canada and then uh, the Project Greenlight program in Vancouver um, will present the program and then we'll go straight into the main focus of this webinar, which is the city of Vancouver. Uh, there'll be an opportunity to write questions in the chat uh, or the Q&A uh, function. Uh, so feel free throughout the presentation uh, and I'll ask these uh, after the presentations. Uh, and then we'll find the final, finally go through um, how to get involved and how you can engage by either EU TechBridge, LCBA Canada, or actually directly into the Project Greenlight program. So first of all, uh, just introduce myself. I'm Scott Allison, a senior project manager at CLEAN, which is the uh, environmental cluster of Denmark. Uh, and I am representing a program that we uh, CLEAN is part of, which is called EU TechBridge. Um, and it's a program that's co-funded by the COSME program of the European Union with a focus on, as you can see here, that we are engaging North American end users that are interested in uh, clean tech solutions. Uh, we are focusing on supporting European SMEs uh, to enter the US market and meet potential buyers. Uh, as I said, we focus on the small and medium sized enterprises, um, SMEs, as we call them, uh, and engage different end users in North America that are looking for uh, innovative technologies or solutions within energy uh, and water. Uh, you can see on the right here, we've engaged in a number of different areas. Um, uh, and this is a, 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 a two year program um, where we have been engaging different uh, stakeholders from different regions in the US and Canada. So just quickly, just to give you a quick overview where we've been working, um, we're currently active in New York um, uh, and collaborating uh, with NYSERDA on the MPI building challenge in mobilizing European SMEs to be part of that program. Uh, we are working with Heinz, um, one of the biggest building owners of New York, um, uh, to support their net zero buildings and actually looking at the heat infrastructure. Um, and we're also working with the New York Department of Environmental Protection and um, uh, with stormwater and nature-based solutions. We're also engaging in Massachusetts and the Massachusetts Water Resource Authority um, and doing uh, energy efficiency and kind of uh, water-based issues. We're also across in Los Angeles, again with the Los Angeles Sanitation uh, Department. We are currently now engaging in Milwaukee and kind of the Midwest area. And as we're discussing today, uh, Vancouver. So we've been collaborating with Project Greenlight program, uh, which you'll hear a little bit uh, later in the program. Uh, the project itself is very simple. We focus on matching uh, tech, uh, basically needs or gaps that uh, an end user has with innovative technologies from our networks across Europe. Um, we facilitate virtual kind of screening and then uh, matchmaking uh, with the aim of actually bringing European SMEs to North America uh, to establish to basically partnerships and hopefully business opportunities uh, in the future. You can see here the five project partners we have. We have Sustainable Business Hub from um, Sweden. Uh, we have Clean, uh, based in Denmark, who I represent. We have Avaisen, which is based in Spain. Uh, Lombardi Energy Clean Tech Cluster in Italy and Water Alliance in the Netherlands. So we're a cross European partnership. And I'll just now pass you over uh, to uh, Jose Canjur, 
Kanjura, who's representing uh, the EU-funded low carbon and circular economy business action in Canada, LCBA Canada. Uh, and he's representing as the team lead uh, and a team based of clean tech business leaders and facilitates collaboration between Canadian buyers and European suppliers. So we have a similar kind of agenda. That's why we're collaborating today. So over to you, Jose. Thank you very much, Scott, and good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and uh, tell you more about the Low Carbon and Circular Economy Business Action in Canada project. We're also very pleased to be collaborating with the EU Tech Bridge project and supporting the Vancouver Economic Commission and Project Greenlight. So I have a few minutes to tell you more about the project and um, tell you about some of the upcoming opportunities that we have available. So the LCBA Canada project is a three-year three year EU-funded program that facilitates business collaboration between Canadian private or public organizations and European suppliers of clean technology. The project started in September of 2020, and we are active until August 2023. And during this time, we are expected to promote and support at least 32 business commercial transactions for an accumulated value of 32 million euros approximately 46 million Canadian dollars. And um, we are also expected to measure the net environmental impact of the transactions we support to corroborate the crucial role of the private sector in decarbonization. Much like uh, Scott's project, we focus on supporting small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as uh, mature startups and uh, small mid-caps. So we work, uh, the LCBA Canada work with partners uh, in some of Canada's highest emitting sectors because we believe that these sectors hold the greatest incentive to um, adopt low carbon and circular economy solutions. So from the beginning of the project, we have been uh, working with Canadian partners to identify market opportunities in the transportation sector, in buildings, real estate and infrastructure, in uh, the waste and uh, plastics sector, and uh, in the electricity sector as well. So what you see on screen right now are some of the opportunities that we have identified with our partners in each of the sectors. And some of these opportunities have already been brought to market. We also work with the heavy industry sector, with agriculture, agri-food and aquaculture, and uh, with oil and gas. And um, the LCBA Canada project has successfully been implemented, uh, implementing a challenge pitch methodology. And that the way it works is that uh, first we identify and work with um, Canadian partners. And um, with them, we work together to pre-identify opportunities that we can bring to market. We call these opportunities challenges. Then um, we work with the uh, Canadian partners to articulate these challenges, and then we validate them in the European clean tech ecosystem to ensure that solutions for these uh, challenges do exist. With this information, then uh, we launch a call for expressions of interest and we invite European SMEs, uh, small mid caps and mature startups to apply to pitch their solution to any of the challenges available. When we receive the applications, we, um, we then select a long list of uh, European companies that meet our eligibility criteria. And, and after that, we work diligently with, the, um, with our Canadian partners, the challenge owners to a uh, short list a uh, list of about three to four European companies, which will be invited to pitch their, uh, their solution to, to any of our challenges. Then um, we hold uh, challenge pitch events and we invite the companies to pitch their solution there. After the event, um, the Canadian buyers select the companies with the most promising solutions or technologies to continue conversations from there. And the LCBA Canada project provides some technical assistance and some support to, uh, to uh, sign a joint business concept. And then we continue ongoing support to get us to commercialization uh, with the hope of arriving at a business deal. So we have already brought two challenge pitch events to, to market. The first one was on April of this year. And, uh, and the other one most recently, the most recent one happened in September of this year. 
And uh, through these two events, we feature a total of 20 challenges, which we brought to market from 11 different Canadian buyers. And we had 44 European companies pitch their solutions to these challenges. And um, we're currently preparing for our next major event, which will happen in February, 2022. And we're about to launch our new set of uh, calls for challenge applications. We will have uh, some opportunities come out as early as next week with more opportunities becoming available the week of November 8th. We will also feature challenges from the Neighborhood Energy Utility Challenge, which you will hear more about soon. And um, we invite you to stay connected, to visit uh, the LCBA Canada Project website and uh, to register on our platform to receive updates and more information. And um, I will stop here. Thank you very much. We can uh, answer any questions you may have afterwards. And now I will just introduce our next speaker. Uh, John McPherson. John works for the Vancouver Economic Commission, an agency of the city of Vancouver mandated to help build a prosperous zero carbon and resilient economy. John leads innovation and commercialization programming, including the flagship project Greenlight Initiative. And um, welcome, the floor is yours, John. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we're, we're proud to be a partner um, of AU Tech Bridge and LCBA. Um, well, um, I'd like to just speak to you a little bit about the program, Project Greenlight, in which you will be applying um, to the NEU Challenge. So this, this is a program that is delivered by the Vancouver Economic Commission, um, an agency of the city of Vancouver with support from Foresight Canada um, and funding by the government of Canada. And we're proud to have LCBA and the EU Tech Bridge um, as supporting partners. So the, these are some of the challenges that we're hoping to address through our program. We're, we're hoping to help the city of Vancouver and other partners in our demonstration network achieve their renewable energy targets, um, build smarter and greener infrastructure, accelerate digital transformation um, and help support um, you know, the city and others in our demonstration network achieve their targets um, through a more flexible uh, procurement approach. So this is what we've created. This is the, what we consider a platform for innovation, the Project Greenlight Program. Um, underpinning the transformation of cities are major asset owners. They hold the keys to um, the pace in which we transition to a smarter and greener future. Um, as decarbonization um, becomes more of a priority um, and transformation, we are here as a supporting partner to help the city of Vancouver and others reach their goals. So what we're talking about here today is the city of Vancouver's challenge. Um, to transition the neighborhood energy utility to 100% renewable energy by 2030. So how it works, you would create an account um, on our platform, um, complete a company profile, submit an online application, um, and engage with the city of Vancouver and potentially pitch after we've gone through an assessment process to the city of Vancouver, um, after which you would be an opportunity to refine your proposal more and if you are selected as the winner, you would be able to execute and deploy your solution with the city of Vancouver. So here, here's where you will find more information on the challenge um, at www.projectgreenlight.io. Um, and this is the website that has all the details on the challenge statement, um, operational details, et cetera, and how to apply. Um, so please visit this website after our webinar to find out more information uh, on the city of Vancouver's any challenge. So right now we'll hand it off to uh, the city of Vancouver's um, engineering team to go into more details about what the challenge is all about. Thank you.
Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, John, and thank you, Scott and Jose. Um, we're excited to, to be here. My name is Ashley St. Clair. I'm a senior planner with the City of Vancouver uh, and the Neighborhood Energy Utility. Um, I'll take you through some materials today with my colleague, Derek Pope, who is a senior engineer with uh, the Neighborhood Energy Utility Group as well. Um, we hope this is insightful and that uh, we're able to answer any, any questions that you might have on the challenge uh, that we're facing. So the challenge is to transition the NEU to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And today I wanted to give a bit of policy background with respect to what is, what is it that's driving us, um, give an overview of the NEU and our operations, um, talk about potential solutions and resources with respect to the Project Greenlight Challenge, and then of course take any questions. So we are um, in Vancouver on the west coast of British Columbia, Canada. And uh, like, like many cities around the world, um, our residents have been increasingly feeling the impacts of climate change, um, particularly with events like extended periods of smoke from forest fires um, leading to decreased air quality, uh, the recent heat dome and heat wave this summer. And then of course, um, sea level rise and flooding are always uh, front and center being a coastal city. So under Vancouver's Greenest City Action Plan, uh, the city has been working towards GHG reductions uh, since um, back to 2007. And recently city council uh, unanimously declared a climate emergency. Um, so that is they, they acknowledge that there is a great deal more to do um, and we need to act uh, faster and more aggressively. And um, as a part of the climate emergency action plan council set a target to reduce GHGs to 50% uh, of 2007 levels by 2030. Oops. So this is a profile of uh, where Vancouver's community emissions are coming from. So you'll see that a significant portion, 54%, uh, comes from the use of natural gas in, in buildings for space heating and hot water. 39% uh, comes from um, our vehicle fleets and 4% from waste, so uh, the decomposition of organics at the landfill and 2% from electricity use. So we are fortunate that we um, have a low carbon electric grid uh, that is primarily hydro powered. So under the climate emergency action plan, um, there are six big moves um, that together will allow us to achieve our carbon reduction targets. Um, I'll focus in on big move four here, which is uh, zero emission space uh, and, and water heating. Um, so this is really the driver to decarbonize um, new and existing buildings. So there, there are many components under big move four, um, including uh, some key ones, which, which is setting carbon um, pollution limits. So GHG intensity limits um, for not only new buildings, but existing building stock. Um, and big move four is, um, is where the NEU, and uh, you can see the, NE, the NEU here, um, we have committed to developing a roadmap to 100% renewable energy. So jumping into uh, the NEU, the utility itself and the origins. Um, so we're located in Southeast Falls Creek, um, uh, part of Vancouver that was initially a brownfield site. So 80 acres historically used for, for industrial purposes. And in 2006, council approved a development plan that saw 6 million square feet of new development added to the area, including um, the Olympic Village uh, that would host the athletes for the 2010 Winter Olympic Games. Um, at that time, the decision was made to, for the city to develop a low carbon district energy system to supply space, heat and hot water to buildings in, in that area, uh, instead of each building having its own natural gas boiler, which, which was the practice at the time. 
Uh, so the system was developed as the first large scale sewage heat recovery system in North America. Uh, this is uh, just a, a quick snapshot showing um, showing the area and the original Southeast Falls Creek area. Um, you can see the, the scale of construction in advance of the Olympics um, with uh, all the cranes here, which really facilitated um, construction of our of our piping network, um, the ability to, to lay it all down at once. So the utility became operational in 2010. Um, we are owned and operated by the city of Vancouver, but we are financially self-sustaining, meaning that all costs are recovered through our rates. Uh, so we're not subsidized by Vancouver um, taxpayers. Um, we have seen significant growth and expansion beyond that original boundary that you just saw. Um, since 2010, and we now service um, 43 buildings, or we, we have 43 buildings connected, and um, the target is to deliver 70% renewable energy, um, and that's through a mix of the a waste heat recovery from sewage, uh, renewable natural gas, and, uh, and the electric grid. Um, as I mentioned, we've, we've committed to developing um, this roadmap to, to transition to 100%. Uh, at this point, I will hand it off to Derek, my colleague, who will uh, just take you through a quick tour of the system and uh, run through our operations and uh, some of the more technical components. I'll stop sharing so he can share. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Um, hello, everyone. So this is a, a map of our, our system. Um, and buildings in red are ones that we're currently servicing. And so I'll just walk you through um, how we're producing our energy currently. Um, starting here, this is our, our False Creek Energy Center. Um, this is where most of our energy is produced. We built a plant on top of a, a sewage pumping station. Um, which gives us access to really large volumes of, of wastewater. And, uh, and so what we do is we extract some of the thermal energy from that wastewater using a, a heat pump. We currently have three megawatts of heat pump capacity for sewage heat recovery. And we're in the process of adding another 6.7. So that, that, that extra 6.7 should be online by next year. Um, and then we, we have uh, gas boilers that we use for peaking and, and also for, for backup. Um, we also now have a satellite boiler plant um, and that was meant to, to help accommodate the, the growth in the system and, and also just um, add to the overall resiliency of the system by having a, a second uh, major source of, of thermal energy. The third thing on here is we do have one building where we are recovering heat from the building's cooling system. And so in the summertime, um, when the building's in cooling mode, um, instead of all of that waste heat being rejected to a cooling tower, um, what the building's doing is they instead run it through a heat recovery chiller um, that can then reject that thermal energy into our thermal grid. Now, the other thing you can see on this map is all of the, the blue uh, polygons. Um, so those are buildings that we plan to expand to as they redevelop. Um, they're areas where there's going to be a major redevelopment uh, taking place and, and uh, in increases in, in density, um, which would make them opportunistic um, areas to expand the utility into to service. Um, so you can see lots of, lots of growth uh, forecast on the horizon. Um, as one step to support this growth, we currently have an active procurement um, for low carbon thermal energy um, in an area called Northeast Falls Creek, just at the, the top of the map here. Um, and this, this could be a shift in, in sort of our ownership model where um, we would still own the, the thermal grid, um, but uh, we're looking for uh, someone that could build the energy generation facility um, and, and own and operate that and, and put energy into our grid through an energy purchase agreement. So we're testing that out currently through a, a request for proposals. 
So that's sort of the, the lay of the land. Um, just to make sure we're, we're all on the same page, I'll, I'll just quickly walk us through a really simplistic illustration of how a district energy system works um, based on the audience. This is probably uh, overkill, but uh, uh, real quickly, um, what we have here is, is uh, a thermal grid um, uh, where we move energy uh, through a, a hydronic piping system. Um, so we've got our, our False Creek Energy Center here. Um, what's cool about it, as, as I mentioned, is we did build it on top of a sewage pumping station. So all of the, the sewage from the neighborhood flows to this pumping station. It's a low point in the city. And then it would get pumped off to a wastewater treatment plant. And um, sewage is, is warm. It's warm because we all take hot showers, uh, dishwasher, um, things like that. Um, so thermal energy is constantly being dumped into our sewer system and it's just flowing uh, beneath our, our roadways. And so um, we take some of that sewage, we bring it into the plant, we harvest some of that waste heat using a heat pump um, and the heat pump rejects that waste heat into our own closed loop piping system. Um, so we can produce pretty hot water using a heat pump up to 80 degrees Celsius um, using the heat pump. Uh, we also have the gas boilers that we can then use to, to top up um, the temperatures as needed if we have particularly high system demand. And so leaving our plant, we have hot water that ranges between 65 to 95 degrees Celsius. Um, that water gets pumped to our customers and in each one of the buildings we'd have uh, an energy transfer station, um, which is the interface between our uh, thermal grid and the building systems. It's basically a, a couple of heat exchangers um, that the building can use to pull thermal energy off of our grid um, to, uh, to, for, for the building's heating uh, systems and for the building's domestic hot water. Now, what I think is really cool about this is um, sort of the energy cycle of it all. So the building's taking heat out of our grid some of that heat they're using for domestic hot water. So they're taking hot showers. That thermal ener energy then goes directly back into the sewer system, flows back to our plant, and, and we re-harvest uh, the energy that they're sending back to us. So I really like that. Um, but yeah, then uh, cool water uh, gets pumped back to our plant, and we, we sort of start the, the process all over again. So um, that's, that's how that works. Um, here's a, a picture of what a, a sewage heat recovery system looks like for anyone who's curious. Um, basically what, what we're looking at here, green pipes signify sewage flowing through them. Um, so taking sewage to this vessel here, which is called a, an evaporator. Um, in here, the warmth of the sewage is enough to uh, vaporize a, a refrigerant, which has a very low boiling point. Um, one thing you can't see here is there's a compressor that compresses that that vaporized refrigerant and when you compress a gas it it makes it uh, extremely hot and that hot gas is then moved to this vessel here which is called the condenser and and that's where the heat is then put into our our uh, hydronic system uh, if i was to do a, a 180 on this photograph you'd see a big empty space in our in our plant and and that's where uh, we reserve space for the expansion of this, which is currently underway. So we'll be adding an, another six megawatts of, of uh, um, heat pump capacity. This is what our distribution network looks like. Um, and so it's, it's just a buried pipe. The, these pipes actually come uh, uh, from Denmark. Uh, we've adopted the, the European piping system. Uh, it's insulated steel piping. Um, that run through our roadways and connect into each of uh, the buildings that, that we service. Um, so the piping is capable of accommodating our, our operating pressures and temperatures of 95C and 1,000 kilopascals. And then this is what a, an energy transfer station looks like within each one of the buildings that we service. And so you can see there's there's two two heat exchangers, one for the building's domestic hot water and one for the building's heating system. And that's the interface where the, the transfer of thermal energy uh, takes place. 
So here we're getting um, a little bit into the technical um, and it's really to give um, people viewing here a, a sense of what kind of temperatures we need to, to operate this system. So I think the most important uh, for today is, is this line up here. This is the temperature um, that leaves our plant and it's based on the outside air temperature. So when it's warm, um, we can meet our system demands with a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius. Um, that really allows us to leverage our, our heat pump technology. As it starts getting colder out, um, we need to start increasing the supply system temperature to meet the, the system demand. And, and that's when we'd start supplementing uh, a bit with our, our gas boilers. Our heat pumps can do up to 80 degrees Celsius. And so beyond that, then we um, re really need to, to make use of uh, the, the gas boilers. And that's of course to meet the, the building's requirements. So on the coldest day of the year, a building um, is designed typically to, to need about 70 degrees Celsius. And on the domestic hot water side of things, um, the, the standard or code here is that um, hot water be stored at 60 degrees Celsius in a storage tank within a building. So that's why we, we can never come below 65 degrees uh, Celsius supplies. We, we need to be able to heat up the buildings domestic to, to 60 degrees Celsius. Now, when we um, start thinking about um, how we're going to get to 100%, as Ashley mentioned, we, we currently supply at 70% of our energy from renewables. Um, and that, that's sort of a, a comfortable compromise. 70% um, roughly equates to the base load of your system. And so what, what, what one of the big challenges of transitioning to 100% is how are we going to deal with our peak loads using something other than the natural gas? And these slides are, are meant to sort of help illustrate that. So on, on the top here, this is a, a forecast of what our, our system demand will be in, in the year 2030. Um, and what, what you see, th these are the different months of the year. First of all, there's, there's very large seasonal um, differences in, in the load profile, of course. Um, so in the summer, it's just domestic hot water versus the winter where we see big heating demands. Um, but the other thing is there's also very large daily um, swings in, in the system demand. And that's because you can imagine first thing in the morning, everyone's waking up and, and suddenly the, the domestic hot water use goes way up as people are getting ready to, to, to go to work. Um, and so it's during those peak periods where it's quite convenient to deploy something like a, a gas boiler. Um, this load duration curve um, gives you a sense of, of what, um, and this is from last year, so what our, our um, demands were in, in kilowatts here and, and the number of hours they were at that demand. And this should sort of help illustrate it where for um, less than a thousand hours per year, we can see our demand as high as 20 megawatts, um, whereas for the other uh, 7,000 hours per year, um, it would be under 10 megawatts. And so using, uh, when, when we increase our, our sewage heat recovery, we'll, we'll be able to pick up most of our demand using that heat pump. And, and you, with the heat pump, that's capital intensive, you want to make really good utilization of it. But again, the challenge is how, how do we address this piece of the pie here, um, where you need something that you're, you're only going to utilize intermittently, but is still um, uh, generating renewable energy. Um, that, that to us is probably the biggest challenge of this. The other uh, big challenge is that we are also a, a rapidly growing system. So not only do we need to think about how we're going to transition to 100%, we also need to think about how are we going to be bringing on the renewables required to, to meet the growing demand of the system. And so that's what this graph is meant to show that we're, we're now, um, rather than looking at capacity, we're now looking at annual uh, energy production in, in gigawatt hours uh, over time. And so you can see in, in uh, the current year, um, we've, we, we use our existing three megawatt sewage heat recovery, we blend with renewable natural gas, and then we top up with conventional natural gas. And that's how we get to 70% of our energy from renewables. Um, we talked about this expanded sewage heat recovery system, so that's going to give us a, a nice bump up in our renewable energy capacity, um, so we can 
um, probably overachieve on our target for the next couple of years. But what you can see is a, a really steep increase in our um, system uh, uh, energy production requirements. Um, and by year 2035, it'll more than double from where we're at today. So we've got uh, a you know, big chunk of the pie to figure out where that renewable energy is gonna come from. And then of course, we need to figure out how, how we're gonna get off of uh, natural gas for that um, last 30% uh, of the, the lift there. Okay, I'm gonna hand it back to Ashley to just walk us through the, the final couple of slides here, and then I think we'll shift it over to Q&A. Perfect, uh, thanks, Derek. Um, so yeah, thanks for walking us through um, the NEU's operations and some of our challenges. And uh, I wanted to loop back to the core challenge here, which is the, the transition, uh, the, the challenge we have out to transition to 100%. Um, and talk about what, what types of solutions that we might be looking for. Um, so we are open to a diverse array of solutions. Um, they should ultimately be compatible with our operating conditions. Um, and, but they don't necessarily need to be holistic in that they don't need to solve the whole problem um, as there will very likely be more than one solution or tool or, or phase of implementation necessary to get us to that 100% mark. Um, with respect to technology, we see solutions manifesting in different ways. Um, so as Derek emphasized, we, we obviously need to bring on more low carbon supply as, as we continue to grow. Um, but there are also big gains to be had through, through operational efficiency measures. Um, for example, it'll, it will be very important for us to manage or, or shave our peak demand in order to decarbonize that piece of our system. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so um, I wanted to highlight uh, some of the key elements that are really important to us. Um, so of course, uh, we would like to see a solution that has a material impact to our emissions profile. Um, cost is uh, very important um, because our costs flow through to our rates. Um, and we do, it is a, a high priority for us to ensure affordable and um, competitive low carbon energy rates for customers. Um, space is a really unique constraint. Uh, we are in a, a dense urban environment and we, we don't necessarily have uh, loads of, of space um, that other uh, district energy systems might have um, for things like large so solar um, fields or large scale seasonal storage. Um, but what, it, what I would say is space is an important consideration when thinking about the ability to implement a solution. Um, so we invite creativity and, and some thought towards that, but it isn't something that necessarily needs to be 100% resolved in order to submit a proposed solution. Um, for environmental impact, we, we do want to minimize uh, impacts to the environment as much as possible. So that is impact to the natural environment, um, like potable water use, air quality, or impacts to the urban environment. Um, so considerations around noise impacts, um, impacts to traffic, et cetera. Um, and uh, as the final piece, it's, it's, it is really important that the solution is, is reliable and ultimately enhances the resiliency of, of our system. Um, for potential solutions, we, we've put uh, a whole host of them up, up on the slide here. Um, thermal storage, heat recovery and heat pumps, uh, AI smart technology for controls alternative fuels, um, the list isn't inclusive um, and we're, we're just really looking forward to, to seeing what types of opportunities come out of this challenge. Great, so I've put um, some resources uh, on, on this slide that, that could be helpful and um, they, they are links. So um, ideally we'll be able to circulate a, a copy of the deck. Um, and one that I, I will highlight that's kind of neat is um, the first one, which is um, a video tour, which uh, walks you through uh, the, the sewer heat recovery plant that, that we have 
uh, so you can get an inside look. Uh, next slide. Perfect. So I um, I think I'll wrap. We'll wrap it up there, and we'll open it up to questions. Just after uh, highlighting the submission deadline again, which is uh, November twelfth, uh, coming pretty quick. Thanks. Super. Thanks, uh, Ashley and Derek. Um, very interesting um, presentation there. Uh, there's been a few questions in the chat. I can see. Um, with one in terms of uh, the possibility of a European technology or solution engaging or being part of a solution for the Vancouver, or do they, can, is it possible for a European company just to be selected, or should they be partnering up with Canadian companies? And I can see John says that there is no requirement for that. And that's uh, an additional kind of question I would have for me is after the, the deadline of the, uh, the 12th, obviously there's a process of evaluating. If they are selected, what is the process afterwards uh, in terms of time frame uh, in your own Right. Um, I mean, if, if they are selected, um, I, I don't have a, a specific time frame, but we would need to go through our um, City of Vancouver procurement process. Um, I, I am able to provide um, a link if, if, um, if you like to, um, to sort of what, what the city's policy is around uh, and, and rules are around that, that process. I'm happy to add a little bit to that, Ashley, if you'd like. Yeah, please. Um, so we've we've worked with um, we work um, through this program with the chief procurement officer of the city of Vancouver. Um, essentially, recognizes this um, platform project Greenlight as an RFEOI vehicle. Um, so any um, and so it sort of augments the existing processes. Um, so you go through that channel, but we're um, complementary to the existing um, procurement process. Um, we're trying to make it easier for innovators to, <clears throat> to engage the city through Project Greenlight. So we're creating an effective um, onboarding platform that you can go through. Um, and so, yeah, we, we essentially it's up to a branch manager, division manager at the city to, um, to go through the regular processes, but we're hoping to create a more streamlined um, process for innovators. And uh, John, may I may I add something here as well from from the LCBA Canada project? Is that um, by the way we we are also um, uh, collaborating with the Vancouver Economic Commission on on this project, and um, we are featuring this challenge as part of our call for expressions of interest through the LCBA Canada project, which means that uh, if European innovators apply through the LCBA Canada to, to work on the neighborhood energy utility challenge. The LCBA Canada can also provide some support and, and assistance in the way of uh, you know, technical assistance, uh, providing companies with information about how to do business in Canada, help them navigate the regulatory system, et cetera. And, uh, and we will be happy to, to do that. Great, that's very helpful. I'm sure very, very much welcomed. Thank you. Cool. I can see there's a there's a question around um, from Simon Deverd about how much energy do the heat pumps that drive the system use, and would optimization of their operation aid in reaching net zero? Um, so we currently have three megawatts of uh, heat pump capacity installed. They, they operate um, pretty much flat out because of uh, almost being a little undersized for our load profile right now. Um, as we are about to bring on another six megawatts, 6.6 .6 megawatts, 6.7 megawatts, um, there'll be periods of time where, where that amount of heat pump capacity actually exceeds our, our system demand. So how, how, how much they're utilized sort of depends on where we are and the build out and, and things like that. Um, I can tell you efficiency wise, um, we're, we're seeing um, COPs, coefficients of performance of um, uh, above three. So 
between 300 350 percent efficiency um, which is pretty close to the rated value of the the heat pumps um, that said if there's ways of somehow in improving the efficiency of those operations that would be something we'd be interested to, to learn either getting more more out of them or, or less electrical inputs into them um, certainly that, that, that would be of interest cool um, you also uh, mentioned obviously the the neighborhood energy utility is fully owned by the city itself um, and part of the solutions I saw you present to Ashley was that you're looking potentially for optimization and kind of energy efficiency uh, type solutions which would require potentially other stakeholders involved in terms of buildings etc is that something to be considered in such a submission uh, um, yeah I, I would say that um, we are open to two solutions that do involve stakeholders um, particularly at the building level um, we do through our uh, neighborhood energy utility bylaw have and also our Vancouver's building code we we do have um, the ability to to control in um, mechanical equipment or or building practices or things that, that go into that building um, at that sort of granular level within our service area. Um, so solutions that involve the building side, we're, we're certainly open to. Yeah, just to, to build on what Ashley was saying there, it's like we, we work pretty closely with the mechanical designers of, of any building that's tying into the system to, to make sure that it's going to be designed to be compatible with the, the system. And so there, there's definitely opportunities to influence um, efficiency measures and, and, and things like that uh, at, at the building scale. Um, and sorry, just one other thing I had back on the heat pump comment. The, the other thing that we'd be interested in and I think Europe might be a little bit ahead here is, is heat pumps that can produce at higher temperatures um, would, would definitely be of interest as well. Um, you, you, you saw that we supply up to 95 C um, and you know, that that's beyond the, the limits of the heat pumps that we have available to us. If there's um, high temperature heat pumps, um, that's something that could be one of the tools that we use um, to move away from, from gas during um, peak demands. Cool, thanks. I have, uh, yeah, one final thing would be, um, you mentioned a number of kind of key criteria that uh, submission is. Uh, is there anything, word of advice for any company, especially from Europe that's applying that should be focused on uh, in relation to those key cr criteria? I would, um... Yeah, I, I would probably highlight, and I did it in the presentation, the just the the unique um, nature of the the space constraints. Um, so we are looking for for solutions that are sort of creative um, to to fit within uh, a dense urban environment. And um, like I said, if that involves uh, solutions that. Uh, need to be implemented as a part of third-party construction. We're we're open to that. That's something that um, I, I think Derek highlighted on our map. Our our peaking plant that we're in the middle of commissioning right now is um, it's integrated in the um, in the parkade uh, this sub um, the basement parkade of a uh, an affordable housing development that the city led. Um, so we're, we're open to collaborating, you know, across the city, across groups and, and with our, um, the developments in our area. So, um, yeah, I, I would highlight that. Super. Um, I don't think there is any other questions I can see. Um, so we can maybe, uh, wrap up unless any of the panelists, uh, would like to add anything. I have some closing remarks about how to get involved. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything from the panelists to say. Nope. We're just, uh, we're really, really looking forward to seeing um, what comes in. We're, we're really hopeful. We're excited to put this roadmap together and uh, and get it in front of council and, uh, and start implementing.
cool. And then um, there was a question around sharing the slides uh, afterwards. We'll share this uh, with all the participants um, today. Uh, it's also being recorded, um, which we can be shared as well. Uh, just a quick reminder, obviously the deadline for submitting is on the 12th of November and you have to apply via the Project Greenlights uh, site that uh, John went through uh, earlier. So I'd urge you to kind of engage if this is really um, interesting for you. And of course, um, feel free to reach out to either LCBA Canada or EU TechBridge, so myself uh, at EU TechBridge from the European side, if you want any support or uh, engagement in kind of applying for this, we're, we're happy to help. Um, and we are collaborating together, LCBA Canada and EU TechBridge on this, uh, this, this process. So here's the info about us all so if you want any further information you can contact us uh, and visit our websites um i'll just say thanks to the speakers today obviously thanks to city of vancouver uh, derek and ashley uh, very informative and uh, also john and uh, jose um and we yeah look forward to hearing any kind of feedback and comments and if you want to uh, apply feel free go straight to the project green lights otherwise you can contact us as directly so Thanks for today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everyone.